Hello, everyone. So I'm excited to welcome Darian Heyman, a leading nonprofit expert and best-selling author of two books. Darian has spent his career guiding mission-driven organizations on how to grow and create positive change. He is here to discuss his popular book, Nonprofit Management 101. This practical guidebook offers solutions contributed from veteran leaders to help nonprofit founders master all aspects of building a sustainable organization. Darian will also share advice on fundraising, leading team, planning strategically, and more. And we'll also discuss about how um, about his journey of becoming an author, like exactly what type of problems he faced in the book writing, publishing, and marketing. And then we'll learn from him, like how we can avoid those problems. Darian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Right. So um, you own helpingpeoplehelp.org, right? Uh, yeah, it's my uh, nonprofit consultancy. That I started, okay. Yeah. And um, so tell me more about exactly what you do over here. So I basically, I think you, I believe you work with nonprofit organizations and help them grow, like get funding and then how to manage teams. So how do you do that? What's the process looks like? And in what areas you help them and in what areas you don't you can't help them exactly how do you define the difference yeah so it's not just nonprofits it's basically all mission led organizations so that includes mostly nonprofits but also i work with some philanthropists and help do philanthropic advising uh, i work with some mission led businesses and help them with their corporate responsibility and foundation work uh, etc but it's basically working with people who want to make the world a better place uh, and helping connect them to the best practices, the helpful resources, and the contacts they need to maximize impact. And so uh, what that really looks like, uh, tactically speaking, is uh, I do consulting and executive coaching. Uh, the executive coaching is basically one-on-one -on -one sort of real-time problem solving with CEOs and nonprofit executive directors. Uh, but most of the work tends to be focused on fundraising, boards, uh, and strategy. Uh, those are by far the most common things that I see mission-led organizations struggling with. I also work in, you know, HR and finance and a variety of other areas. Um, but yeah, the coaching is, is you know, kind of a, a chance for me to work directly with leaders and really help them work through some of their challenges as they prepare for major fundraising meetings or have to deal with hiring or annual budgets or whatever it might be. The uh, consulting work is where there's a, a much larger and a much more clearly defined scope of work where you know, there's a big project that I can essentially prescribe or envision. And for those, I'll put together sort of hand-picked teams based on the unique needs of the client, typically women and people of color uh, who are sort of overqualified experts in the field and in whatever areas the, the clients need help in. Uh, and then I'll manage those teams. And so, yeah, that's basically what I do. Mm. And I think fundraising is kind of one of the most important and vital um piece of the entire game and so many founders struggle with it like what approach makes the biggest difference when it comes to bringing in funding i mean it really depends on the organization and on the mission uh if it's for profit if it's non-profit if it's focused on education or clean water if it's a you know new organization or if it's been around for years uh size and scale etc so it's it's hard to sort of say uh, you know, something that's true for everyone. What I would say is that, um, uh, you know, for the most part, especially when groups are just getting started out, and I work with a lot of small grassroots led organizations, um, when groups are really first starting out, what most people don't recognize is that there's about 1.8 million nonprofits registered in the US, and about half of them have budgets underneath $100,000. Uh, so they're small grassroots organizations, typically with no paid staff, and just a really passionate founder. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if you're in the early stages of thinking of setting up a nonprofit, um, first of all, I would encourage you uh, to look and see who else is out there that's already doing this kind of work uh, and really consider this, this philosophy of sort of seek first to collaborate and only then to lead. In you know, in the early days when you're first getting started, really the two things you should be focusing on are to your point, fundraising, and then the programs or the strategy or partnerships, et cetera. And uh, so there's something called a fiscal sponsor, which means you can essentially come under the umbrella of an existing nonprofit. 
Uh, and that gives you a lot more credibility. It gives you, uh, you know, sort of a bigger budget on paper. So it enables you to, to start to raise institutional capital much more quickly, meaning money from foundations, companies, the government, et cetera. Uh, so that's something I would really encourage people in the early days. But usually if you're setting up a, you know, an independent organization, for the first couple of years, it's really hard to get access to that institutional capital. Again, one of the reasons why fiscal sponsorship is a great option. <laughs> and so you're really looking at uh, raising money from individuals, from donors and supporters. Uh, and that's where the personal relationships are absolutely critical. Uh, you know, in the early days, it's most common, whether you're doing events or just going out to your network, essentially to reach out to your friends and family, share a vision, talk about your personal connection and why you're passionate about it. And essentially, you know, let them know what you're, what you're hoping to achieve and invite their support, their align. And again, the personal relationships are a, a large part of what drives people to write checks and, and donate in the early days. Once, you know, you're, you're a bit further along, you know, typically you've got a couple of years of, of traction, uh, you know, you start to expand the budget a little bit. That's when you can really start to go after foundation grants, corporate government support, et cetera. Um, you know, for those more than the relationships and the personal connections and being able to really uh, compellingly articulate your work, the thing that's most important with institutional fundraising is really making sure you very clearly understand the goals and objectives uh, of the grantor and you can help them understand how funding your organization will advance their goals. So it's almost, you know, flipping the script on its head and really focusing on more of essentially in, in the for-profit world, what would be called consultative sales. Instead of just selling someone a pen, you're asking them about their needs, their goals, and then, oh, guess what? The pen is the solution, right? And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a different sort of positioning and strategy with the institutional players. Uh, but those are kind of the two most important things to keep in mind in the early days. The other thing, because there tends to be a lot of shame and awkwardness around fundraising, uh, is it's really helpful for people to recognize what one of my fundraising mentors and Shiro's Case Sprinkle Grace says, which is that people don't give to you, they give through you. So you're not raising money for yourself or even for your organization. You're raising money for the children that you're feeding or the homeless that you're clothing or uh, whatever it might be, the seniors that you're serving. Uh, and so really coming at it from that perspective uh, and less from a begging for alms, uh, you know, kind of tin cup approach to fundraising and more from a, hey, we're throwing this party and it's a beautiful thing. It's going to be really impactful. It's going to have, uh, it's going to change people's lives in all these ways. And if you want to be part of it, we invite you to join us. Uh, so it's more of an invitation versus an ask. Uh, and I find that those are some of the most helpful things to keep in mind early on. I have no idea how to run and manage a nonprofit. It's like uh, over here, like we run for profit organization. Um, what do you think? What are the key differences between um, managing and running a for profit and nonprofit or a mission driven organization? Like, what's the difference? Like, how, how to set up the vision and then how to attract the team, how to hire the team, how to manage the team, um, and then how to uh, make profit and eventually. Um, how will you draw, like spe specifically in the nonprofit and a mission driven org organization? Like, how will you draw the line that, okay, so I'm this organization is making this amount of money, I'm gonna withdraw this amount of salary for me over there. Like, how can you draw that line? And um, and how, um, uh, like for example, initially if the if the if the organization is not in is not making any money at all, or maybe it's, we also have to pay our employees and the team members, and we also have to uh, fulfill the, the, the mission that we are after. Uh, at that time, like, are we still going to pay ourselves? And like, how can someone overcome these type of um, issues? Right. So yeah, what's your thought I mean on this? You're talking about sort of going from a hobby to a profession, yeah, yeah. Uh, which of course. affects a lot of people in the early days. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions. I know my grandma used to say to me all the time, oh, you work in nonprofit, that means you don't get paid, right? So that's obviously not the case. It's a, it's a huge component of the U.S. economy. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of organizations and a lot of leaders that this is their life's work, myself included. 
uh, you know, I do have a, a private sector background right out of university. I started what turned out to be one of the first digital advertising agencies. And we grew that company to almost 400 employees in over 20 countries uh, and half a billion dollars in annual billings after we sold it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I had a, a great experience in the for-profit world. Uh, and I did find that a lot of those skills were transferable into the nonprofit and social impact world. Uh, and there are definitely some differences. At, at, on, on the most fundamental of levels, when you just look at the finances and the, and, you know, uh, and the bookkeeping of nonprofits versus for, for profits, there is one fundamental difference, which is essentially restricted revenue. Uh, with the business, every dollar that comes in the door, you can use for whatever purpose you want, right? Yeah. And generally, people are giving you that money because they're buying the product or they're investing in the business, and then it's sort of yours to do with what you will. Uh, in the nonprofit world, that's not the case. You can get what's called general operating support, you know, sort of money that you can use for whatever you want. Uh, a lot of individual donations take that form, a lot of event revenue, uh, et cetera. But there's also restricted income. So I can give you, if you run an NGO, I can give you a dollar or a million dollars and I could say, I only want you to use this money for this program or for this purpose or by this time. And then you are legally and ethically bound to do so or to circle back to the donor and say, hey, we shut that program down. We're going to use it for this. Is that OK? Right. So, you know, there is a, a fundamental financial difference there. Uh, you know, but from a standpoint of, you know, the bigger strategic questions, you know, the vision and the mission and things like that, that is pretty similar to the for-profit world. If you're going out into the marketplace, you know, whether it's the economic marketplace or the attention economy uh, that we all live within, you need to be able to very clearly, compellingly, and concisely convey why people should care, what is the problem you're here to solve, and what you're doing about it. Uh, and how they can participate, whether that's by buying a product to solve a need or by supporting a cause to address a social concern. Uh, so you still need that storytelling. You still need that clear strategy and an ability to help convey something to people, get them excited and get them to want to get involved in some way. Um, you know, for, uh, in, in terms of the professionalizing question and getting paid, uh, you know, this is pretty similar to a for profit business. The the company that I started, we started, you know, when I was still in my university town out of an on-campus apartment with, you know, one laptop on top of a mini fridge before we grew and exploded. And the same thing was true when I started the foundation for Craigslist and I was working out of my bedroom. We had, uh, you know, basically no money and it was a startup. And so in those cases, just like in the for-profit world, the founders are the last people to get paid. You use your money for everything else first. Yeah. Um, you know, at a certain point, uh, you build and you really try to to create an organization. So instead of just a personal project, and again, this tends to happen once you're over a hundred thousand dollars a year. Now all of a sudden you've got enough money to start making some of these decisions about you know paying staff and uh, building out the infrastructure of the organization. Uh, and you also will have a board because by design, nonprofits are not owned by the operators like businesses are. They're owned by the people, by the government. And you are entrusted with, uh, you know, following a social mission, which is why you're not paying taxes. So it's not your organization or cause, it's the people's cause. And you are the trustee uh, that is directing that. And that also means in part that you're recruiting a board. Just when you first start a nonprofit, you need at least three people on the board. Uh, and that is the group that's really approving an annual budget, which could include something like a, like a salary for you. And even still, even if you get to the point where the board can approve a budget that includes some kind of compensation, you're there's a big asterisk next to it, and you're still the last person to get paid. So if things don't work out as well as planned, you know, guess what is getting shortchanged? It's probably going to be your compensation. Um, you know, but a lot of those are issues really affect, affecting nonprofit founders uh, as opposed to employees. You know, again, the, the uh, nonprofit uh, industry, if you will, contributes to a huge percentage of the GDP. So there are millions of people working for established organizations that don't have to concern themselves with, you know, is there going to be enough money to pay me? They have a job. They've been promised a certain salary, et cetera. Uh, and so it really depends on what you know stage of the life cycle you're entering the world in. 
And at what point you decide that you want to write a book about this topic? And uh, was it all instant or did someone reach out to you and ask you that? Yeah, I mean, I I had always wanted to write a book. I actually, after my dot-com experience, I went traveling. I was traveling the world for six months. That was also when September 11th happened. And I basically was, you know, really thinking deeply uh, about my purpose in the world, my work. Uh, and that's when I decided to devote my career and my life to social impact and to philanthropy. So that's the work I've been doing since for the last 20 something years. Um, you know, as I mentioned, one of my my first uh, sort of experiences in the world of social impact and philanthropy was restarting and running Craigslist Foundation. And while I was there, uh, you know, I, I first of all, I did a big listening tour to find out, you know, how the NGO and nonprofit sector works, what's missing, how we could add some value. Uh, and also really thinking about Craigslist, the company, and what it would look like to translate their mission and their vision into the nonprofit and social impact world. What I landed on is that Craigslist fundamentally is about people helping people. And if we took a mirror image of that in the philanthropic landscape, it was about helping people help. Uh, and that's where I landed on my life's work, the name of my consultancy. And in particular, what I found was that the, the nonprofit world is very fragmented. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of really small grassroots organizations. There's a lot of people that, you know, their mom gets sick or they uh, see a dead whale on the beach or whatever it might be. They they have some moment of inspiration and then they want to run out and start a new organization. Again, I would encourage them to collaborate with existing groups or to find a fiscal sponsor before they set up their own nonprofit. But regardless of whatever path they take, um, you know, they're sort of, uh, you know, really just trying to figure it out. And there's it's not like the business world where anyone who creates a business plan would be laughed out of the room if it did not include a competitive analysis. Most nonprofits get started and are duplicating the work of several other organizations right off the bat that they don't even know about. And so, like I said, it's a very fragmented sector. And the, the solution to this that I crafted was something called Nonprofit Bootcamp, basically a one-day conference focused on all aspects of starting and running a successful nonprofit, um, became the largest nonprofit gathering in San Francisco Bay Area history after only one year. Uh, and we had 10,000 graduates in my five-year tenure, uh, really transformational program. And uh, out of that conference, uh, you know, part of the conference was a big exhibit hall where we had different groups providing support to nonprofits. We had a hundred partner organizations, basically everyone that helps provide support to the nonprofit landscape was in the room. Uh, so it was like Lollapalooza for nonprofits. And one of the exhibitors uh, is the largest nonprofit publisher. They're called Wiley and Sons, and they have a, a mark called Jossie Bass. Um, and so they actually approached me and had and said, hey, we, we love what you're doing with this nonprofit boot camp. Have you ever thought about making it a book? Uh, and I thought that was a great idea. My board chair at the time had actually been the CEO of that publisher. And so we sat down, we had lunch, uh, the publisher pitched us on the book idea. Uh, they said that the next step would be filling out sort of a, you know, a, a concept paper or an application. And I said I was too busy uh, running the organization. And the publisher actually offered to write the paper for me, uh, which they did. So that was uh, obviously a good sign. And then my, my board chair, who again had been their CEO, essentially negotiated this contract um, for us to write this book. And then the board essentially got cold feet and said, hey, you're understaffed, you're over leveraged, you know, we don't want you to take this project on right now. And so it sat there for a year or two until I uh, decided to transition out of the organization and ask for permission to take it on as a personal project. Uh, now, obviously, most people who are writing a book are not going to be in that fortunate situation where a publisher put them, they write the concept paper for them, and you have someone who used to work there negotiating the contract on your behalf. Um, but what I would say, especially because, you know, I took a class on writing your first novel and getting it published, uh, you know, that's something I had been thinking about uh, well before this. What I would say is, you know, that it starts with a really clear idea of, you know, what is the gap that you want to fill? And maybe that's a fiction and it's a story that you want to tell. Uh, you know, maybe it's nonfiction and it's a, a gap in the marketplace that you want to fill. For me, it was there's no, you know, Google for good. There's no one place to go to find everything you need to start or run a more successful nonprofit. That's what the bootcamp was. That's what I wanted the book to be. And um, 
you know, I, I think having a really clear sense of what you're trying to achieve with the book uh, is really helpful. Uh, you know, carving out time to work on it and just literally putting it in your calendar and considering it sacred. Uh, and if it has to be rescheduled, moving it to some other time and slot. Um, and then the the model of writing the book, I think, is really important. Uh, and this was a big discovery for me and a huge difference between my first and my second book. Um, for the first book, uh, it's both of the books are essentially an anthology, meaning they're, you know, they consist of chapters from a bunch of different experts. In the first book, uh, Nonprofit Management 101, I had over 50, <clears throat> 50 experts on all aspects of nonprofit management. Uh, and I came up with a common chapter structure to sort of maximize legibility and make sure that read, you know, reader retention was going to be very high. Uh, and I gave this format to these 50 very uh, powerful and recognized experts and asked them to contribute chapters. And that was a lot of work. Uh, a lot of people missed the deadlines. A lot of people weren't good writers. A lot of people ignored this chapter structure. <laughs> and so it was quite a bit uh, of an effort to coordinate all of that. It took me about two years. And then I would edit those chapters, send them back. They would, you know, reply to my edits. And that's, you know, sort of, sort of how we did the book. But what happened for the afterward uh, actually became the model for my second book, which was, uh, there's a woman named, um, uh, named Lynn Twist, who's a very recognized fundraising guru, has a book called The Soul of Money that's very popular. And she agreed to do the afterward, but was essentially too busy uh, to write it herself. So I just interviewed her, kind of like we're doing right now. And then based on that transcript and based on a, a little summary that I made right afterwards saying, here's what I heard her say and how I would frame it. Uh, I had my my colleague, uh, Layla Brenner, who had worked with me at Craigslist Foundation, who was my co-author on the second book uh, and essentially a ghostwriter on the first book. She would take those transcripts and especially my summary and, tr and turn them into a draft of the chapter which I would then edit, send to someone like Lynn, and she would write back and say, looks good or changes. That process was infinitely easier and quicker than asking people to write them themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that became the model for the entire second book, which took me six months instead of two years. Um, mm -hmm. And it was all based on interviews. And actually for my next book, I'm, I'm starting to work on a book called AI for Good. That's all about how nonprofits can you know, practically put into practice uh, AI and technological tools and developments. Uh, not only am I planning on using that same model, but I'm also planning on using AI to take the transcripts and the summaries and draft the chapters. Uh, so imagine ChatGPT is sort of going to be my co-author uh, along with Cheryl Conti on this next book. Uh, and I'm excited to try that out and see how that works. But the point is there's a lot of resources out there and, um, whatever it looks like for you, I, I do think there's different pieces to the writing process and writing the very first words on the page is sort of one skill set, and then editing and refining is sort of another. And a lot of people don't have both and that's okay. I think it's about being honest with yourself and figuring out, you know, what is the best approach to create the content and then to get it over the finish line. And then separately from that is ensuring there's an audience for it as well. Okay. And, um, what would you recommend? Like, of course, you have worked with ghostwriters for your book. What would be your as advice for those people like who are hiring a ghostwriter? How to set up the meeting with them? How to actually, what are the initial work they have to do before they start working with a ghostwriter? And um, how did you uh, set up the meetings and how what kind of schedule you had with them? Um, so you mentioned that they used to write the book and then you used to edit that and then provide the feedback. Uh, can you share with us the entire process, like break it down into a uh, step-by-step? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it depends on the, on the author and on the ghost writer. Um, what I would say, especially thinking back to that class that I took, that was more about fiction and writing your first novel. Um, you know, a lot of the people that were most successful in that class were very rigorous when it came to sort of, creating a, a summary or a structure like a skeleton of their book and yeah. that's exactly what i did uh with my nonfiction book where i had a table of contents i had uh you know really thought through how everything was going to flow what the different parts or sections of the book would be and essentially what would be contained in each chapter 
it's a little bit easier with nonfiction because it's sort of different topics versus fiction is a bit more of like the storyline and what's happening with character development. But, you know, I think the, the common thread is you should have a clear vision, not only for the overarching book and what you're trying to achieve, but really for the structure and the flow and also the workflow. And, you know, is it going to be based off of interviews? Is it uh, is it the ghostwriter interviewing you and asking you, OK, tell me about what you want to happen in this chapter? Uh, OK, now where do things go here? Uh, but either way. Um, there was there was clarity in advance around how we were going to be working together and that workflow, uh, and it worked for both of us. And I think that's the thing that's most important is not any one set approach, um, but that you're in clear communication with your co-author or guest writer uh, or ghost writer, and uh, that you really try to stick to that process and timeline. Um, you know, and in my case, uh, you know, the, there was, there were peaks and valleys. There were times when I was conducting on the interviews, there wasn't as much for her to do. And then sort of after they had been conducted, now there was a bunch of content, uh, that yeah. came in, uh, that she was able to focus on and, you know, basically just project manage all of those different interviews and getting them into chapter structure, having me edit them, uh, get them to the interviewee to make sure they were comfortable with how, the way we were framing their insights, uh, and then finally to the publisher. And um, how did you make sure that your own authentic voice was intact in the book, like if the ghostwriter was writing it? Yeah, I mean, I I held the final pen. So for me, I was always like the last person to touch the content. Uh, and I, you know, definitely have a unique voice. And I also have, uh, you know, part of what I learned in that initial listening tour when I got into the nonprofit world is there's a lot of abstract ideas and vague concepts and theories out there. And there's not enough of the tactical, practical tips and tools, do this, don't do this, here's how to type content out there with conferences, with books, et cetera. And so that's essentially been become my life's work. And it was really important to me that we sort of cut through the clutter and landed on those insights and those nuggets that people could put to practice immediately so they would leave the, the reading the book not only inspired but inspired to action and that was at the core of what i was looking for uh and i was you know bolding and italicizing different comments so they'd sort of jump off the page almost like highlighters um you know so i i had a, a specific way that was really all designed around maximizing usability uh and practicality of the book uh, and, you know, in other things, it might be more about storytelling or voice, et cetera. But again, it, it, at least for me, it's a lot harder to sort of start writing the first words on a page, but responding back to a draft of something, even if I rewrite the whole thing completely yeah. and reframe it, uh, is still really helpful. Uh, and so, you know, it was just basically a, a pretty fluid process where there was open communication, which I think is the most important thing. And did you also have any sort of NDA in place with the co-writer? I did not. Uh, I'm kind of a footloose and fancy free trusting guy, uh, to maybe to the point of being naive at times, but I had worked with her for years. I trust her deeply. Uh, I consider her a friend. Uh, and so I was not really very worried about, you know, uh, any kind of issues like that. Um, I also was the one who had the contract with the publisher um, for the second book. I did give her a with credit on the first book. For the second book, she was my co-author, so it was the two of us uh, that wrote it, um, but we had a private agreement in terms of the royalties and the advance and her compensation and all of that. So all of that was certainly agreed to in terms of here's the work, here's the compensation, here's the credit. Um, and as long as you're clear on that, I think that's the most important thing. Obviously, if you're working with someone that you don't know personally, I would I would think having some paperwork in place would probably be a good idea just to protect your interests. Yeah, yeah. And uh, are you comfortable sharing like um, how much usually hiring a course writer costs? Like uh, how much do we have to pay them? Is it expensive? Is it fine? Like, and what are the different compensation uh, levels we can work with them? Yeah, um, I can't really speak to all the different options that are out there. I can, I can certainly share my experience and I'm happy to be totally transparent about it. Um, I have come across a couple other colleagues who are ghostwriters, and I believe most of them charge on an hourly fee structure. 
Uh, I'm sure some of them have it like a, a lawyer where there's a retainer that you draw down against, um, you know, and I'm sure some of them are also open to doing it as a project based fee. But, you know, it's almost like, you know, creating a movie or, or a piece of art. You're never totally done with it and you could always put more time into it. So I would imagine if someone has been a ghostwriter on multiple projects, they would want to protect themselves from the author that, you know, keeps going back for another revision and asking for more of their time. So my guess is most people out there would be looking, especially if you didn't have a personal connection, would be looking at an hourly rate uh, and just managing against that. In my case, first of all, there was the personal relationship. Second of all, there was alignment on the work. You know, Layla really wanted to see these books produced and uh, had a direct sense as a nonprofit professional of how they could make the world a better place, how they would tie into her life's work. And so she she wanted to do it to work with me, to make a little money, but all, most of all, to create this impact. And so that made things much easier. Um, you know, in our case, uh, basically, I offered to give her half of the advance. Uh, so I got a $10,000 advance. Uh, which apparently is pretty good for a nonprofit author. If you're Stephen King or, you know, something like that, I'm sure you're, you're, there's a lot more zeros there. But nonprofit is sort of a smaller vertical, even though there's almost 2 million of us in the country, uh, 2 million organizations at least, uh, a lot more than that in terms of employees and volunteers, et cetera. Um, but, you know, usually, you know, what I was told is a, a decently performing nonprofit book we'll sell maybe 10,000 copies. And that was sort of the goal for both of my books. We were able to achieve both of those, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, that was the way the advance worked. And then there was also royalties uh, and it seems a bit complicated. It looks like it's about a dollar per book, essentially that, that works out. Um, and the royalties, uh, you know, just came to me. Uh, they, it hasn't been a huge moneymaker for me. Again, I've done two uh, books, both of which were bestsellers on Amazon, uh, probably sold a total of maybe 40, 50,000 copies of books. Uh, and I've probably made uh, 20, maybe thirty-five, forty thousand $40,000 total between the two $10,000 advances uh, and the royalties I've received since. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, the money directly from the book sales has never been a primary focus of mine. It's nice supplemental income, uh, yeah. but really the you know the it using it as a calling card to generate consulting and coaching business, or um, you know, sort of bolster my credibility when I'm working on a client engagement, et cetera. Uh, that's ultimately where uh, you know the financial return has been seen, as it's generated hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of dollars of income indirectly by sort of uh, bolstering my credibility and giving me a calling card to establish myself as an expert in the field. What are the different ways you are using your book to eventually get your consulting clients and coaching clients? Like, do you literally go in the meetings and hand over the book or like, do you have other? I, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I will give it away as a present to clients or, you know, what have you. Uh, you know, I, I definitely mention the book whenever I'm doing keynotes and stuff. I think, as I mentioned, the book is sort of a calling card. So, you know, when you're an author, especially if you get the book out there in the world and it sort of gets some notoriety and popularity, <clears throat> it will typically lead to speaking engagements, whether that's a podcast like I've worked with you all on, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a conference that I'm keynoting or emceeing or leading a panel, uh, et cetera. I do webinars. Uh, again, it's a bit different for fiction and nonfiction, but for me, I'm an industry professional. B these books sort of bolster my credibility uh, and uh, create some notoriety that leads to me, you know, being selected as a keynote or what have you, delivering a webinar. And for me, as a sort of standing rule, anytime I'm in front of an audience, and I'll I'll make the offer today, um, you know, anytime I'm in, in front of an audience of change makers and people who want to make the world a better place, I sort of make a blanket offer. Uh, that I offer up a free sort of pro bono uh, executive coaching session, just basically 15 or 20 minutes. Usually I'm doing a webinar on how to, you know, raise more money from foundations or uh, with, via social media or put AI into practice for your nonprofit. Uh, and so I'll sort of offer up 15 or 20 minute sessions uh, for free for people that have questions or that want to dive into the specifics of their organization and the challenges they're facing. And I just kind of use those times uh, to, to create some good karma to see how I can be helpful. 
to as many leaders out there as possible. And a subset of those basically wind up saying, oh my God, this is so valuable. And we have a little bit of money. You know, could we hire you? What would that look like? Um, you know, and that turns into the coaching or the consulting gigs that I talked about earlier. Uh, and that's ultimately where, you know, that combined with the stipends for speaking, for leading webinars, et cetera, uh, that's really the basis of my income. Uh, and it's, you know, the, the first book, Nonprofit Management 101, first came out uh, about 20 years ago, um, you know, 15 years ago. So it's been, you know, and it's still in the top 10 of nonprofit books on Amazon. And so if you're lucky and if you produce something that really adds value in the long term, uh, we just released the second edition of it. Uh, you know, then that can that can create many opportunities professionally. And what do you think? How, on average, how much uh, financial return it is generating on a on an yearly basis? Like your books are generating. Um, you know, maybe like five grand, eight grand, something like that. So again, it's it's nice supplemental income. It's not the basis of my income. Uh, not my, the, not the book sales, but uh, using my the book. royalties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, oh, oh. So my royalties are maybe five to eight thousand dollars a year. In mm -hmm. terms of the indirect value, that's really hard to say, right? Like I'm uh, I'm generating a very healthy income through my consulting and coaching business. To what extent is that attributable to the books that I've written? It's it, especially since it's been a while, it's like it's a dotted line. I've done lots of things that have established my credibility. And most of all, I, I take this sort of approach where I give it away for free, whether that's on a webinar or in one of these pro bono coaching sessions and just give people a bunch of my best ideas uh, that, that I think are best suited to help them for free with pretty much no expectations. And in a subset of those cases, they say, we want to work with you and uh, we take it from there. So I, you know, if I couldn't do that, even if I had written a book that was 10 times as popular, I probably wouldn't be seeing a lot of the coaching and consulting income. I may still be able to get the the public speaking honoraria, but even that, if I wasn't a good public speaker, uh, you know, I might get one or two of those, but I'm not going to get referrals and invited back and things like that. So it's just sort of one component of a toolkit. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes when I'm organizing or speaking in an event, We'll distribute free copies of my books to all the attendees. I've also produced my own conference series multiple times, like the nonprofit boot camp. I did a nonprofit fundraising master series where every attendee as part of their registration fee got a free copy of the book, which I signed. Um, you know, so the the book gets integrated into some other uh, you know other outlets as well. But you know, the direct and indirect value of it is uh, at least directly the financial value is is insignificant compared to the yeah. indirect value of coaching, mm -hmm. consulting, honoraria, et cetera. Um, and how much time each week do you invest into your book marketing efforts, like getting on podcasts or doing seminars around book? Like, um, is it just a one-time thing or is it just you are doing it on a regular basis? It's, uh, it's not... It, it tend, it's kind of more like a movie where it tends to really be focused around the release of the book uh, or of the you know opening weekend in the box office, basically. Um, so on an ongoing basis, I'm not allocating a significant amount of time. And, you know, again, it's been 15 years. So I'm in touch with a wide variety of different publishers who are inviting me to speak at their conference or deliver a webinar or sit on a podcast, et cetera. I would say it's probably, you know, two, three hours a month at this point. But again, I'm I'm far down the timeline uh, yeah. from the first book coming out ages ago. Right around the release date, it's it's pretty extensive. And this is sort of one of the interesting things because it, in my mind, publishing is a bit of a broken industry. It's it's pretty archaic. Uh, and they will, you know, they will print your book and maybe get it into Amazon, but it, the marketing is really on you. And as you're putting together a concept paper for a publisher, one of the things they're going to be looking for more than anything else, you know, even more so than like, is there an audience for this book is what is your plan to market it? Because anything they do will be supplemental. And so for me, again, in the case of these nonprofit management and fundraising books, uh, you know, I want them to be a, uh, I want them to be really a resource for the readers and to level up their capacity for social change. 
And so part of what I've done that sort of has supported marketing, but also adds value to the book, um, to the reader, is I've essentially included a, a section that I call book partners. And it's really like a nonprofit support yellow pages. So for the first book, Nonprofit Management 101, I had a hundred different partners, um, all of whom provide different support to nonprofits with fundraising, with marketing, with technology, with you name it, um, you know, their publications, their consultancies, their uh, conference organizers, whatever it might be, but things that the audience should know about. And in, in addition to having a resource review at the end of each chapter, you just learned about foundation fundraising, here's a dozen resources you should know about. There was this whole section of the book with 100 partners, each of whom received a little one paragraph description and a logo. Um, you know, So again, it was kind of like a yellow pages and a value to the reader, but each of those partners also agreed to help support the outreach around the launch. And so I would give them marketing toolkits. Here's some language for email, for newsletter, for um, you know your website. Here's an image library, et cetera, uh, social media copy. So things that they could copy and paste and it would facilitate their outreach. And the reality is a significant number of the partners didn't do much, if anything, to support the marketing. But there were some that sent out dedicated emails that you know put up some social media posts, et cetera. And all of that helps. Because just like when a movie comes out, you really want to build buzz right around the release date. Um, and from what I understand, Amazon and the other booksellers will sort of use your sales right around the release as an indicator of how many copies to stock, et cetera. And so I sort of uh, really focused my marketing efforts and those of this distributed partner network right around the release date. And, you know, that was many hours uh, you know, going into managing those partners, getting those toolkits out, sitting on the podcast, the webinars, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, sending out my own emails and social media posts, and just basically really pumping up the marketing around the release. Uh, you know, that definitely was a significant time investment, you know, leading up to it for a few months, and then uh, sort of after the launch for a couple months. When are you planning to release your your third book? Um, well, let's see. I mean, I, I think before that, we're going to do uh, some partners in Brazil, this group, uh, Philanthropia, uh, translated uh, nonprofit fundraising 101 into Portuguese for the Brazilian market. They're getting ready to do that with nonprofit management 101 with the second edition. So that's sort of the next short term project. But then, as I mentioned, I'm working on the AI for good book. Um, you know, I think my goal would be to pretty much have that the content wrapped up for that by the middle of next year. So whether it comes out at the end of next year or sometime in 2025, um, you know, and, and for me, it's normally it's more about what time of year might be more con most conducive to like helping support sales. In the case of this book, like, you know, a book on AI is going to pretty quickly get outdated, especially if it's tactical, yeah. practical tips and tools and not just concepts. So I think for this one, we're going to want to really condense the window down and and really shrink the amount of time between baking and finalizing the content and when the book hits the shelves. Uh, so hopefully, you know, by the end of next year, we'll, we'll get something out there. Great. What do you think, what has changed? Like you mentioned that you published your first book 15 years ago. And mm. before that as well, like you are still in the business, like pretty successful. But after publishing two books now, what do you think, what are the major changes you see in your life and in your business um, after your books? Um, you know, I think for me, it was just one part of an, a gradual evolution. I've been, you know, dedicated to this work now for, or for 20 years, uh, a bit more. Um, and it's, it's sort of one more stepping stone. So it's hard for me to sort of point specifically to what the books did. What I will say is, uh, you know, if you are seriously thinking about writing a book, especially if it's nonfiction, you mm -hmm. should make really sure like inside yourself that whatever you're writing about is something you want to be talking about for the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, because this is your calling card. It is the thing that, you know, very quickly just in the footer of your email you're going to establish, you know, this is a big part of what I do. In my case, nonprofit management and fundraising, and uh, now looking at AI and tech technological solutions for nonprofits. So it's it's sort of a it creates some gravity, if you will, in around that subject matter. And I think it 
uh, it will, you know, continue to sort of bring you back to that as a focal point of your career uh, and of your your social circles. Uh, so, um, you know, and then I, I think it can also, especially in the case of nonfiction, create a basis for programming, whether that's producing conferences or, uh, you know, webinars, presentations, keynotes, et cetera. Um, you know, it is the basis that, I, that I'm really building off of for the most part when I am doing a keynote or a presentation or uh, talking with someone on a podcast. So again, it's going to have some gravity and you just want to make sure that it's something you really want to talk about for an extended period of time uh, for years to come. Great. Awesome. Darian, I really loved all your insights and um, I'm so happy that how you're using the book and not only the book, you have built so many different pieces uh, to establish your um, your foundation in this specific niche. I think that the thing that you are doing, uh, you're helping other people help, like it's really incredible. So um, it was a pleasure talking to you, Darian, today. And thank you so much for opening up and sharing all of those insights with the audience. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day, everyone.